Welcome to Church Online. My name is Scott, and this is week two of our series, One for All. I'm here at Christmas Village enjoying all the sights and sounds of Christmas time. Now, one of my favorite ways to connect to God is in a time of worship. So we're going to turn it over to the team, and I'll catch up with you guys after. Oh, snowball fight! Snowball fight!
Okay, I think the coast is clear. Whew. I barely survived that one. Well, I hope that all of you online had fun singing along with us and the team. Now, if you're watching this from our app or on Facebook or YouTube, we would love to invite you to the full Church Online experience where you can engage with our Church Online community, share in the experience, and grow together. You can go to live.capechristian.com to create an account and find the next live event. So make sure to sign up or sign in and join the chat where hundreds of people from all over the world log in each week. Now, the best place to connect with them is right there in the chat. And let us know how your week was. Make a new online friend. And then another great way to connect with us is to let us know how we can pray with you. Each week, we want you to know that no matter where you're watching from and what you may be facing, you are not facing it alone. And if you need someone to pray with you or just to talk, please click that live prayer link and one of our hosts will join you for a private prayer chat. And if you're a regular attendee and have never created an account, please do. We really want to get to know you better. And since you are here every week, we want to know how better to serve you. And we wanna stay in touch throughout that week and we don't want you to miss out on anything that comes to your church. If this is your first time joining us for Church Online, I'd like to say a huge welcome. And if you couldn't tell already, we like to have fun. We're so glad that you're here. In fact, we would love the opportunity to get to know you. Right now in the chat, we just posted a connect link just for you. And if you click that link, you'll be given a digital connect card. Fill that out and send it our way. In return, we're gonna send you some information about Cape Christian and Church Online. Thank you so much for checking us out and I look forward to meeting you. Now, for those of us that call Cape Christian home, this is a time you can give your tithes and offerings. And if you've never given through Cape Christian, it's easy to do. Just click the give link at the top of the page or the link in the chat window. From there, you'll be able to create an account on our secure giving platform and start giving through Cape Christian today. Okay, before we jump into the message, we would love to have you join us for our Christmas Eve service here at Church Online. We will be streaming the services starting at 1 p.m. every hour until 6 p.m., all Eastern Standard Times. And for our West Coast fans, even the ones up in Alaska, we want you to know that we're gonna have a special 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time 7 p.m. your time, just so you can join us for our Christmas Eve service. We would love to have you join us. Today, Pastor Joseph is gonna continue our series, One for All. So I'm gonna go grab some hot cocoa, post up by one of these fire pits, and let's see what God has for us next in this awesome Christmas series. I'm excited to start off our, um, uh, our, or to continue on with the One for All series. I'm continuing on with week two. Uh, this, this series is all about one baby that became one man who lived one life and died one death, who had one resurrection for all people of all time. And last week we talked about the baby, but tonight I want to focus on, uh, we're going to focus on the man, uh, the man of Jesus Christ and who he was. And so a couple, a couple resources that you could actually uh, use. I want to shout out uh, Humilitas by John Dixon. Uh, it's a really great, uh, John Dixon was actually a history professor. And so he kind of tackles Jesus based on just a historical perspective in a couple chapters. It's really good. Uh, who is this man by John Ortberg is another great one. Uh, if you want to continue to unpack this topic of Jesus as a man, and then also uh, Liar, Lunatic, or Lord by C.S. Lewis, Lewis kind of poses the question that if we believe that Jesus was a man who walked the earth, who claimed to be God, then we kind of have to do something with him, right? Like you have to, he's either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he's a Lord, and, and uh, packages that. So again, a few resources, but I uh, want to really focus on, on, on him as a man. Corey talked last week, we had some fun uh, with... Um, with uh, Will Ferrell and uh, baby Jesus last week, right? We had the quiz and really tackled some misconceptions that we have um, from Jesus's birth story. And I wanna kinda continue that trend with some misconceptions. Some of us have misconceptions, uh, some of us may know, but who Jesus really was as a man. For instance, even his name, right? Some of us um, may not even really know his name. Um, his name that we get today is from Jesus, but that's actually from the, the, the Greek word that Paul translated his name in the New Testament as Isus, which was later translated into Latin as Jesus, which then we get Jesus in our current English vernacular. But, um, but 
if you were walking down the street and yelled Jesus, or Jesus was walking down the street and somebody yelled Jesus, he wouldn't have turned and looked, looked around. Actually, you would have had to yell Yeshua. Yeshua was actually his name within scripture. And so that's his name in Hebrew. Uh, his profession was not, he didn't like start off Messiah, right? Like at 12 years old, uh, he wasn't just like healing arms and legs growing back and stuff like that. Like his profession was not known as Messiah or savior. His profession was actually that of a, of a carpenter. And we find that in Mark six, actually, the Pharisees kind of used that against him at one point. He's teaching and he's like doing all this stuff. He's really kind of stealing the show from them. And then they're like, what is this? The carpenter boy? Like, is this the carpenter dude? Um, and so we know he was a carpenter growing up. His hometown was Nazareth. Um, and so what, why is that important? The, all these things are important, but in Nazareth is really important because it kind of tells us where he was where he grew up and what that, that area was like. So for me, I grew up in a small town, about 400 people. Some people would say there's more cows than people in that town. Uh, there's one blinking yellow light and people would say the same. It's like, if you blink, you, you're going to miss it. If you drive through it, you miss it. Um, if you're looking for a Florida uh, kind of comparison, I think of like Immokalee, right? Like, you know, anybody know anybody from Immokalee? All right, not, that's kind of the point right there. Not really, right? It's some random town in the middle of the Everglades. You got to drive an hour and a half to get to and then you got to drive another and a half to get away from. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of what Jesus, that's kind of the, the, the comparison to Nazareth of where he was born. Also his image, what he looked like. Some of us still have a picture that adult Jesus was walking around with a sheep in his arms, petting his a sheep like a cat mom, like some weird cat mom walking around. Yeah, like this right here. Um, yeah, I think like Aristocats, later, you know what I mean? The lady in Aristocats walking around singing. Like sometimes we think that with Jesus, except for, you know, change out the mansion with like a prairie field somewhere. You know? He's just like singing songs, you know? Uh, or if you don't like this Jesus, maybe you like more Jurassic Park themed Jesus. You know, that might fit your theme more. <laughs> But at the end of the day, right, like the whole brown hair, blue eyed Jesus holding the sheep, it's just not factual. It's not, it's not real. In fact, we don't really actually know what Jesus looked like. Um, but a, a, a little while back, some, some British scientists and some Israeli archaeologists, they got together and using forensic anthropology, they actually put together um, a, a picture of, of something they believe to be more like the image of what Jesus may have looked like. And this is what they came up with right here. Again, we don't know for sure he was plain. He wouldn't have been picked out of the crowd. We know that because Isaiah 53, 2 says there was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. But this is at least a more realistic, better picture of what he may have or could have looked like, a Middle Eastern man at that time. His language and what he sounded like, contrary to popular belief, Jesus did not speak King James. He didn't come prepackaged with these thous and thines. Uh, this is not factual. He also did not, um, did most likely did not speak any language he wanted to whenever he wanted to, which doing some research this week, I found out a lot of Christians actually think that. Um, uh, I, we, we know that Jesus actually took on human limits. And actually the disciples, a lot of the gospels are actually recording the, the otherworldly, the supernatural events that took place around Jesus' ministry. So if he could just whip out some random language at any point in time, we would really think he, they would have written that part down. <laughs> in fact, in Acts 2, when it happens, they write about it. Wow, everybody's speaking in different tongues. It was crazy. So if Jesus was doing that, they would have written about it. Jesus did grow up in a multilingual culture, though. In, in around his, his hometown of Nazareth, they spoke Aramaic, and the, 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 the language throughout the region was Hebrew. And so Hebrew and Aramaic would have been the two languages he probably most likely spoke. Um, some scholars believe he also had some Greek uh, or knew some Greek as well, because that was the universal language um, at the time still. But most of his messages would have been done in Hebrew or Aramaic. And so um, looking at this image of Jesus, let's throw that back up. And let's just, let's just for a moment, look at this image. I want us to, to kind of go down this road and it's really important. I'm going to tell you why in a second, but I want to just, just travel down this road for a second where we just look at the image. Imagine this, this man's name is Yeshua and let's hear the language Jesus would have spoken in. We're going to play just a 30 second clip. It's the Lord's prayer in Jewish Aramaic. Abund bishmaya. Yit Kadeshmach, Tite Malchutach, Teher Utach, Echmad Bishmaya, Ken Afber A. Lachman de Mer A, Ablan Yomade no Machra, Ushbaklan Chobain, Echmad Afshbaklan Chai Bain, Ve Alta Elan and Isayuna, 
Elat Selan Min Bisha. Amen. It should start to at least change our perception a little bit. And maybe some of us have had misperceptions, misconceived perception. Maybe some of us have kind of gone down that road, or maybe we don't really have a perception of Jesus at all. But this is more the actual genuine picture of who Jesus was as a real man on earth. And the material aspect of knowing and understanding that he was a real man begins to shift things. Because just like last week with the birth story, as Pastor Corey talked about, if we Americanize our Jesus, we can easily distort him and we can start to make him whoever we want him to be. Do we see the flaw in that? And who Jesus is as Christians is who we're supposed to be following, right? So if we're following our own image-based perception of who Jesus is or could be, then we're really following our own image-based God. And that image could just become whoever we want that to become. Yet understanding that Jesus lived a real life And when we start to become more and more grounded in the the reality of the language he spoke, the name he was called, a more realistic version of what he looked like and the impact he made while on earth, then we start to gain a better understanding of who he truly was and what he truly stood for. As we gain a better understanding of who he was and what he stood for, it leads us to a better example of who we should be following. So with that in mind, I want to just talk about four main things that Jesus was, the way he lived his life, four ways that he lived his life that really could, are oftentimes contrary or just we have misconceptions about or don't really fit into our cultural or religious boxes. Number one is Jesus was a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who enjoyed life. Jesus was a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who enjoyed life. And I love this. He was fun. How do I know he was fun? I know it for a couple different ways. Number one, the children loved being around him. He, he was, he kind of coined the phrase, let the children come to me, right? He had, if you, if you, if you um, can't be like the child, then, then you really have no place in the kingdom. And, and, and so he had this thing about kids. And I don't know if you've been hanging around with kids lately. I mentioned I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old, but kids don't like to be around the mean, boring guy in the corner, Newsflash, you gotta be fun. You gotta have something going for you here. And so Jesus was fun. And, and actually, I'm gonna show you quick. Um, there's a quick uh, Chosen clip we're gonna show you here in a second. The Chosen is this series they've been doing just recently um, on, on really Jesus's life and who he was as a man. I think this topic in, is so um, interesting, but I think if you, if you wanna continue to dive into it, The Chosen is another great resource that you could sit back and watch. I think they've done a really great job at really showing and portraying who Jesus was as his life. And so this uh, next clip right here is just an interaction that Jesus has with a couple kids. Let's check that out. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gives forth bread from this earth. And I pray that if there are ever two children who come visit my home here, that you will give them the courage to say shalom, so that they will know they do not have to remain in hiding. He's a good man. Amen. We are going to stay. Yeah. <laughs> What's that sound I hear? Sheep don't sound like that. <laughs> no, that's definitely not sheep. Maybe a rooster? Greetings, children. See, I know it. So, what are you doing here? I'm visiting for a time. Where are you from? Nazareth. What is that hood for? I'm building something. Are you a carpenter? Sometimes, but I'm a craftsman. I build all kinds of things. So, why don't you live in the house? I travel a lot. How do you make money? Happy. Just asking him how he makes money. I know, you shouldn't. It's okay. I don't make money when I travel. So for now, I build things and trade them for my food and clothing. What is that? Ah, this is going to be a lock and key. Joshua, ask him questions. He's nice. No, thank you. What else will you build? Wealthy people love decorations and toys for their children. My family isn't wealthy. Many times that's better. I don't know about that. (laughs) You will. 
My mom made me this. Oh, what's her name? Sarah. Very pretty. I love that clip. I love it. I love his interaction with the children there. And, and sometimes we don't always love to picture our Jesus making fart noises with little kids. Like we don't love that picture all the time. Some of us don't even love that. You know, one of the pastors just said fart in church. They're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll, get to some, I'll get to some more of that later. But, uh, but <laughs> or the Jesus that is willing to sit through. I love that too. Six Y's in a row. Like most, most adults, like seven or eight years old, like, oh my God, for the love of me, for the, you know, Jesus saying that for the love of me, you know, get out of here. Um, I was, I got six year old home. Like for the love of God, this is, this is PTSD right now. This is taking me right back. <laughs> but Jesus had this ability. I love that nature that they're showing him. He's caring. He's taking the time to answer questions. He's laughing with them. Um, I, I love that he engages with her about her doll there and says it's pretty. Um, but he, he, he was fun. Some of you are like, well, that doesn't prove that he was fun. Well, how about here's another one. Sinners were inviting him to their parties. It says sinners and tax collectors. In other words, the people that didn't subscribe to the religion were like, hey, I don't really subscribe to what you're talking about, but you're having a good time out here, and I want you to come to my party next week. Can you come to that? And listen, again, again, the sinners and tax collectors, like, they're not inviting boring, mean people to their house party. In fact, maybe I just helped crack the secret code for some of you for why I haven't been invited to a party in a while. <laughs> <laughs> And that's kind of the point, right? Jesus showed up. He had fun. He enjoyed life. Actually, he slowed down. He walked. It talks about him eating. He, he, he drank. He had a good, fun time, and he enjoyed life. And then he didn't just stop there. He actually invited us to enjoy life. He talks about there's moments on the, on the, on the Sabbath where you weren't supposed to eat anything. And he was telling his disciples, ah, eat, eat some food. Let's have some food. Let's have a good time. And there were constantly times where he was breaking religious or cultural boxes to enjoy and take in life. He actually says, the son of man won't be with you forever, so let's eat and drink while I'm here. That's literally what, that's a quote, that's Jesus talking about this. So he gave us permission, why does it matter? It matters so much because if you're following a rigid Jesus, then you will become a rigid Christian. And the more rigid Christian you become, the more children will start coming up to you, unchurched people will stop inviting you to their houses and to their parties and into their homes. They'll stop inviting you in to speak into their lives. You'll stop having impact, you'll stop having this stuff. Your impact and your, and your influence will only continue to decrease. And why? Not because you're standing up for righteousness. No, because you're following an image that's been given to you of Jesus. This is not biblically factual. It's just not legitimate. Let's make sure that we're continuing to follow the, the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth. And that Jewish carpenter from Nazareth was not too religiously stuck up or set on cultural boxes that he couldn't hang out with children and he couldn't hang out with the unlovable. In fact, he reached out of his way to do that. He's a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who enjoyed life. Jesus was also a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who cared deeply for people. There's a time actually where Jesus walks into a Jewish synagogue and he sees a man with a withered hand. And, and instead of kind of doing what everybody else had done that day, which is just kind of bypass the man and kind of see and go, oh, that's kind of gross. I wish you'd hide that a little bit more. He actually stops in his tracks and he decides to do something about it. Let's check out this clip. Shalom. Even to the 10th generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. May I, may I see? Because they did not meet you with bread and with what? Excuse me, what are you doing? What is your name? Elam. Your friend Elam has a withered hand. Are you a healer? It is not lawful to heal on Sabbath. Which one of you who has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not take hold of it and lift it out? Who are you to speak to our congregation in such a of way? How much more value is this man than a sheep? Stop this at once. Come here. Come stand here. Elam, sit down. We don't know this person. He could be a shaman. Is it lawful on Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life 
or to kill. This affliction does not threaten his life. It does not even affect his health. everything. Wait! Come back! How dare you? I love that Jesus. That's my Jesus. <laughs> I love it for so many reasons. The first thing is he cared. Other people's issues actually matter to him. In fact, many times before Jesus healed or reached out to somebody, it says in scripture, it says this phrase, and he looked out at the crowds or he looked upon the woman or he looked upon the man, had compassion on them. Almost 21 times it says he had compassion on them. Compassion is like passionate love turned to action. It's like, I love you too much to not. I have to move because of this. I moved because of my love for you. And so I will do something about this. And so Jesus cared so deeply that even in the face of right, the religious kind of obstacle, he's like, no, this, this is what matters. The person hurting here. And that's that deeply, again, it matters to us because we're following that Jesus. That means other people's, other people's pain begins to matter to us. We're not just self-centered. We're not just selfish. We're not just self-focused. We think about ourselves and then we go, wait, 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 wait. If God is willing to care about me, then I should be willing to care about others. And just like Jesus modeled this every day within his ministry to care about the other person next to us or the other person outside of our sphere, then we are also meant to do that as Jesus followers. I love that he was willing to do that even when it confronted religion or politics. And that's number three. Jesus enjoyed life. He was a Jewish carpenter who enjoyed life. He was a Jewish carpenter who cared deeply for people. He was also a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who was willing to confront. Jesus wasn't always nice or polite. Oops. In fact, like, I do this too, okay? So, whatever. <laughs> I do this too, like, sometimes I get into my, my prayer life and I think I've already preconditioned the way God's going to respond to me. I've already preconditioned the way Jesus does things, right? Like, I'm in that prayer time and, you know, I'm like, oh, God, you know, I need something from you, God. <laughs> I don't do that with my hands. <laughs> But like, you know, like, Jesus, I need, oh my God, I, I need help. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I just need you. And then, and then like, you know, we all have one of these stories, like the clouds broke and then the whisper and the dove perched onto my shoulder. And he's like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> You're my son and I love you. <laughs> right? Like, I'm not just... And I, and I'm, I mean it, right? I do have stories like that where that's deeply impacted my life. But at the end of the day, that's not always Jesus's response. That's not always what Jesus portrayed to us in scripture. There were times where he took his disciples aside and he loved on them and he cared for them. I'm sure we don't even know the amount of records. It talks about that. We don't even have enough libraries to contain all of the books that we could write about what he did and the love that he showed and the, for, and the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace. But... There are also times, like in Matthew 15, 16, where the disciples are asking for a parable to be explained. This is like the prayer time. God, just, I don't understand. Help me, Jesus. And this is, he responds back with this, Matthew 15, 16. Are you still so dull? <laughs> now, for those of you who need a more like current English vernacular, <laughs> let's take this one to the message. This is how the message translated it. You too, are you being willfully stupid? Jesus, yes, 
That's the Bible. The, the other one is the Passion Translation, right? Even after all I've taught you, you still remain clueless? Imagine like the Messiah, like this is the guy you've been waiting for. We're following him daily after day after day. He talks some parable that's out of our thing. Now, context is important, right? Remember, he was hanging out with about 12, 16 to 23 year old guys. So if you haven't been hanging out with those dudes in a while, you understand why some of this language is put this way. That's basically who I've been hanging out with for the last decade of my life. And I've, I could never m more relate to Jesus. I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you. I've not lost it. I could, whoo, some of these dudes, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I believe too, Jesus is also calling them up. Like he's got to be going. If, even after all I've taught you, you still remain clueless. He's, he's not just putting them down. He's going, he still hangs out with them for the next day. He's like, Peter, you got to get this because it's going to be built on you someday. John, come on. You got to write some important books. And if you guys aren't getting this, nobody's going to get it. You see what I'm saying? Like, so there's moments where that coaching, right? We could get coached all day long, whether it comes to sports, whether it comes to all, to all different types of things that have a surface relevance. It's like, coach them hard, coach, you know, get them. You know, you put your son in the, in the, on, the, on the sports field, on the football field, in a hockey rink, whatever. You're like, coach them hard, coach them hard, coach them hard. And then Jesus is like, okay, let me coach you hard in your marriage. You're like, ah. <laughs> Are you still so dull? You're not doing the drills I've taught you. I've told you to do these drills. I've told you to start caring. I've told you to sit and have conversations, but you're not doing, are you still, you're, and you're waiting for Jesus to whisper good things into your ear and he's trying, but he's trying to knock on your door and go like, hey, but there's a bigger truth here that could help lead to freedom in your marriage. That's a little bit of a bigger deal. Sometimes we're missing, we're missing the truth that Jesus has to offer because we're waiting for the whisper and he's not whispering. He's telling us point blank and clear. Mark 12, 24, the Sadducees came to ask Jesus a question at one point. And it says, in the NIV version, it says, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures of the power of God? The message version says it this way. Jesus said, you're way off base and here's why. One, you don't know what God said. And two, let's go for two. Here's the kicker on two. You don't know how God works. When's the last time you were in a biblical conversation with somebody who kind of knew the scripture and you were like, one, you don't know God, and two, you don't know how he works. <laughs> and you got away with that. And I'm not saying like, right, do be kind, still be kind, everything kind, right? <laughs> do be kind. Now, this isn't licensed. In fact, the only people Jesus talked typically this sharply to was either people that were in his group that he knew he had relational bandwidth with or religious or political people that were, that were pushing people down. They were using their power to push people down. Sometimes we want Jesus to show up and just say, everything's fine. I just want you to be happy. I just want you to know what it means to you. And what does it mean to you? What your truth is your truth. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible is willing to confront both in our own lives and both in political and religious ideologies that would hold people down. That's the Jesus of scripture. And again, why does it matter? Because if you're not following that Jesus, catch this, one, you won't allow him to confront things that need to be confronted in your life. And two, you won't confront entities that are right in front of you that are doing wrong by others in your sphere of influence. We've got to follow the Jesus of the Bible. <laughs> Last thing, number four, Jesus was a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who changed the world. Galatians 3, 26 through 28 says it this way. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, before this point in time, before Jesus showed up, you were known and recognized for what set you apart, not what brought us together. Jesus was the originator of people coming together of every gender, of every nationality, and of every status. See, there was a, never a movement before Jesus that actively sought to include every single human being, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, status, wealth, gender, background, or education, to be loved, to be included, and to be transformed. Before Jesus, not only had there never been a community like this before, there had never been the idea of a community like this before. 
And now we can look around this room and we can see all types of colors, different backgrounds, different languages. And why? Because 2,000 years ago, a carpenter, a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth came and his name was Yeshua and he started a movement as flesh and blood and it has changed the world as we know it. If we look at history, every year on New Year's Day is a mark of when Jesus was given his name. December 25th, right? We celebrate his birth and eight days later, what happens? The new year starts. Why is that relevant? Because in Hebrew culture, that's when he was actually given his name. Eight days later, they'd go to the temple for circumcision and to name him. And so eight days later, every year we are marked with celebrating his birthday and then boom, the new year starts with the day, the iconic day in history that that Jesus got his name and began his known life. Jesus may have lived and died and Caesar never had a hint of his existence, but you and I and everyone else born since 1 AD are all marked not by Caesar's birth, but by the day Jesus was born. Jesus shaped what compassion looks like. In ancient Greece and Rome, it was the strong, it was the beautiful, it was the noble and powerful who were admired. Life was a race for honor and status. The weak and marginal were not valued, especially if they weren't a part of your tribe. Children were not sentimentalized. They were a lot of work and they were often looked at as a nuisance until they came of age. As babies, if they were deformed or if the baby was unwanted for a myriad of reasons, they were discarded, often left outside and exposed until the sun until they died. In fact, for every one million boys, about 300 to 400,000 female children were left to die from exposure because they were unwanted simply due to their gender. Then a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth said, let the children come to me. And he prayed for them and he blessed them. And he said phrases like, unless you become like a little child, you cannot even enter the kingdom of God. And true followers of Jesus took these statements seriously. Followers of Jesus were the ones who started to take in unwanted children for the first time ever. They were the ones who built the first orphanages. Jesus cared for those who seemed to have no value in society time and time again. In fact, in In Roman culture, if you outlived your husband and you became a widow, you would be fined by the government because you would become a drag on the economy. It was Jesus' followers who first coined the phrase that true spirituality that is pure in the eyes of God is to make a difference in the lives of the orphans and widows and their troubles. Rome would often discard and throw out their sick, but the first hospital was started in the fourth century by a Jesus follower named Saint Benedict. By the sixth centuries, monasteries would have hospitals attached to them. This idea that we should have compassion on all who are weak began to become more widespread. At the Geneva Convention, an organization arose to alleviate human suffering. They chose a large cross as their symbol on their flag to represent that the man they were following was a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who died on a cross. That organization later became known as the Red Cross. World Vision, Salvation Army, St. Jude, all of them have roots in the movement of Jesus Christ, the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth. Even if education, if we look at education, at one point in time, Jesus said, love God with all of your mind. And his followers took it seriously. And since children mattered to them as well, Christ followers are the first ones who begin to put an importance on educating kids as well. Churches began to build schools, then they began to start universities, initially in Paris in the 12th century, then Oxford, then Cambridge, founded by followers of Jesus. In fact, Harvard was founded on, one of, on, on this statement, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. In fact, 92% of the first 138 colleges and universities in America were begun by followers of Jesus. The gospels are now translated in over 2,000 and 200 languages. There is no other book that comes close. Imagine a world with no Martin Luther, no King James, no Bach who dedicated his work to the glory of God, no Hallelujah Chorus, no Mozart Requiem, no Sistine Chapel, no Da Vinci's Last Supper. There's simply been no transcendent vision of reality that has gripped the artistic imagination like the vision of a carpenter from Nazareth. Jesus changed political theory. He changed human rights. He changed our idea of justice. Even our our declaration of independence reads, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The idea, at least in concept, came from the idea that all human beings have been made by a good God and his image, and they are loved by him. A Jesus follower first penned the phrase, there is now neither Jew nor Greek nor male or female, no slave or master. Historian Thomas K. 
Daniel said it's the first expression of egalitarianism in human history. Listen, there are more paintings, more buildings, more art, more education, more freedom for women, children, and men, regardless of race, gender, or creed that are linked to this one man than any other man in human history. Jesus changed the world as we know it. It's undeniable. He changed it. And inquiring minds would start to ask, why? What did he do it for? He did it to reveal the Father to us. And you know what? You want to know what the Father wanted to reveal to us? That he loved us. Jesus as a man was here. Not just, I'm not talking about just as a baby. I'm not talking about his death which showed some things, some important, incredible things. We're going to talk about that next week. But, but the, the, the mind, the thought process, the inquiring mind, would, the, the why question would be, why did he just parachute down then? Yeah. Why did he just parachute down from heaven, right? Stay for about a day, find out how bad it was, die for a day, go pop back up the next day. It could have been a quick trip. Right. <laughs> why? What was the importance of living as a man yeah. to show us to show us that God loves us, that God has a purpose for us, that there's actually some significance to this life that we've been given, that we can walk here on earth, that we were meant to actually enjoy what we've been given. We were meant to walk out to an 85 degree day in December in Florida and smell the air and go, wow, it's blue skies and there's sun out here and actually not get sick of or, or get rid of or lose sight of the fact that this earth has been a gift to us from our heavenly father, that we can love here, that we can experience amazing things and beauty here. We were also meant to be taught that we're supposed to care for the person next to us. And Jesus, the man, taught us that. His death didn't teach us that. His, his baby didn't teach us that. But the man, the man, the lifestyle of Jesus Christ taught us that when you care for somebody else, it also gives life to them. It also gives life back to us. There's something invigorating about it. There's something amazing about it. There's something beautiful and life-giving about actually caring about the people next to us. That was groundbreaking when he showed up. We're supposed to learn all of a sudden that, whoa, we can confront. We have the ability to confront. The way we live our life is actually able to change. You're in the middle of a bad practice. You're in the middle of a bad addiction. You're in the middle of a bad marriage. You're in the middle of something. Guess what? Jesus gave you hope even in the fact that you can confront that situation and it can be changed. <laughs> Jesus, the man taught us that. You seen somebody else in the dumps? Guess what? You seen some, some political, some religious ideology that's holding people down? Guess who is here, who's meant to stand in the gap, who's meant to help the marginalized, help the oppressed, help the down and out? It's you. It's you. Jesus, the man, told us that. Romans 8, 29 says it this way. Romans 8, 29, throw that up. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. Yes! I don't want the frou-frou, froofy, petting a lamb Jesus. Anyway, who wants that? But that's not the life that they revealed to us. Thank Jesus. That he gave us something so beautiful and so amazing. It's Christmas season. As we think about the birth story, and we, we're, we, we, we focus a lot on the death, remember that there's this beautiful, iconic moment for about three years recorded that we got to see Jesus as a man, and he shaped the trajectory of history and for the better. He saved it. He saved us. And today, I believe through him and him revealing God to us, God is calling us by name today. Some of you, for all different reasons, I'm actually going to just invite you to close your eyes right now. Just take an internal moment right now. I didn't plan on this. I just felt this right now in the moment, but just take an internal moment. Some of us, some of you are in this space and you're just, you haven't been enjoying life. 
And some of you have even put a spiritual emphasis on it. Oh, I can't enjoy life because God said it's going to be hard. But Jesus had the craziest mission of all time. He knew where he was headed. He knew he was going to die on a cross, and yet he took time to enjoy this world. Find a way to enjoy life. Find a way to embrace this season. Some of us have stopped caring deeply for others. We stopped caring about others. Become a little bit too much self-focused and just self-focused, and we've ended the road there. I encourage you, I invite you to start to look again at the life of Jesus, to start to be inspired by his life again. Reopen that door. Start to notice and focus on somebody else in the room. See how you can impact them for the better. Speak life, speak purpose, speak hope over them. Some of us have stopped confronting situations in our own heart, situations in our own life. Situations around us. Whichever one it is, I want to encourage you, I want to invite you into. Maybe it's the first time, maybe it's the hundredth time, but invites you into relationship with this Jesus. Maybe for some of you, it's the first time you've heard it in this way. But he's calling you by name. He's inviting you back to relationship with him, to live a lifestyle like he lived, to walk like he walked, to talk like he talked. God, I pray for this church right now. I pray for these people. I thank you for who you were. Thank you for what you came and did, not just dying on a cross, but living a life that was worthy of following. God, I pray that each person here, whether for the first time or for the hundredth time, will commit to following you and that we will continue to see not only our life improve, but the lives of those around us continue to improve because of your impact and your significance in our life. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Joseph. What a powerful reminder that Jesus was a real man who lived a real life that ultimately changed the world as we know it and has the ability to change our world as well. Today, if you decided to take that first step to give your life to Christ, I wanna be the first to say congratulations. As you continue to grow in your faith and become who God has created you to be, we want you to know that we're so excited to be a part of your journey. So today, if you committed your life to Christ, we would like to send you a short video each day this week. These short videos are awesome resources as you continue to walk that first week out. Living for Christ truly is life-changing, and I'm so excited for what's in store. To receive these videos, just click the connect link that appears after you click the link in the chat saying you'd like to commit your life to Christ. Or simply text Cape Yes to 94000. Congratulations, this truly is a special day. The chat is going to remain open for the next few moments, and if you need anything at all, please let us know. Hang out for a bit, connect with others here, and if you'd like someone to pray with you, you can always click that live prayer button. And if you haven't downloaded the app yet, the Cape Christian app is the best place to connect with us during the week and get plugged into everything that's going on here at Cape Christian. Thanks again, church, and we'll see you next week for week three of our series, One for All.